From the New York Institute for the Humanities, I'm Eric Banks. Few figures in the 20th century combine musicianship and critical acuity to such a degree of accomplishment in each sphere as did the pianist and writer Charles Rosen. In this episode, we revisit the James Lecture that Rosen delivered in October 1978 at the Institute, on stage and at the keyboard, titled Memory in Romantic Song Cycles. You, you have developed over the, the years at the end of the 18th century a way of looking at landscape which insists upon a kind of double time scale and sometimes even a triple one. Which, which succeeds, you see, in turning landscape into a very powerful elegiac art that creates its meaning literally from the elements of the painting itself. That is, when they mean that, they meant, you see, that the, you take the images of nature, they do not yet mean what the 20th century artists mean by creating meaning from the elements of the medium by, by the paint itself, although, in fact, they, be, they come very close to that. But they, 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 they do... Uh, insist upon creating meaning from the very elements of landscape and from their juxtaposition and the order in which they come. Uh, Some of this is, not not all of that, some of this is quite explicit in Schiller, who says uh, that the explicit meaning of a poem is unique, but the implicit meaning which all readers are going to read into it is, of course, infinite. The problem for the artist is to control the meanings that will be read into it, and it would be cowardice to try and leave that to chance that the creation of an evocative art, and of course the idea of creating an art that, cons- that consists of things that are not there, that you have through, through this a landscape art which is continuous meditation on permanence and change, and substituting for the historical staffage, that is these little personages that dot the landscape and ornament it and give it a kind of history, you get a kind of staffage of memory, which is particularly clear in the poetic landscapes, but even clear in the, in the painted ones. And of course, it is due to this whole technique that we have that magnificent renewal of lyric poetry at the beginning of the 19th century. Now, a similar movement goes on so somewhat later. It's about 10 or 15 years after this, uh, or 20 years, with, the, with the, uh, what might be called the triumph of the lead, of the song. That is, that the song is raised from a, what might be called a genre. That is, that from an, in, an inferior form of art, like, like a genre painting, which is also given that same raise. The landscape is a genre painting, and which is now raised to the, to the level of historical painting. The lead also is now raised to, to the, the form of high art. And that occurs at the beginning of the 19th century. And of course, it's monumental aspect is the song cycle, of which there, are, in fact, are not very many of that particular period. Five, as far as I know. The great date for this, uh, for the creation of the lead, which uh, this is not a specifically landscape poem before you think that I'm doing, of course, the, the, the first great song of Schubert, which precedes, in fact, the greatest songs of Beethoven, was written on October 19th, 1814 and that is Gretchen at the spinning wheel. And of course, what is clear about Gretchen at the spinning wheel is that you immediately have this double, double time scale and, of course, the use of memory against a scene, a people, that is, the use of memory in a scene that is clearly depicted and clearly delineated in a way um, that is certainly, certainly new. The spinning, of course, is given to the piano. The memory is given to the voice. And the structure of the song is determined by that in a way that I think has not really been discussed. Uh, because there are, there are aspects, the harmony has sometimes been discussed, but there are aspects of the texture that have not. And it seems to me that that is what really has, creates the song here and gives that interplay between memory and the picture of a specific scene. The, the presence, of course, of the spinning is, is given in two ways. You have the, the wheel going round in the right hand and the movement of the pedal for the spinning wheel in the left. Is that I'm sorry about is that I can't really play this the problem. That is that the obviously is the movement. That, this, this is not the, I'm not telling you anything new. Everybody knows that already, you see. But there are, 
Well, there's one point which I don't think has been pointed out, which is that the harmonic structure of the piece is related very closely to the texture. And it is a strange harmonic structure. That is, as it begins in D minor, each verse modulates away from it. Uh, the voice ending with the piano in a different key. But the voice never brings back the original key. It's always the spinning wheel that brings back the original key. The spinning wheel returns to that. The voice actually merely takes up that as it comes. That is, that I can only show you how that is done, is that it's uh, a little hard over there. It's always the it's always the, the 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 reality, which is of course the spinning, what is actually taking place that brings you back, and the voice that again that takes off with the memories. The most extraordinary change of texture occurs at the point when Gretchen begins to think of what Faust actually looked like. Up until then, everything has been more or less the texture is absolutely even. You constantly have this motion. That is both both motions of the and the. But when she starts thinking of what Faust looked like, the reality begins to move back, and you suddenly you no longer hear the pedal. That is, instead of hearing that, you hear. So, in other words, that. The, the wheel continues, continues to turn, but the actual sound of what is going on, or the reality of the scene, dis begins to disappear. And of course, it, finally the wheel, at the moment that she thinks of his kiss, uh, that's the famous part where it stops altogether. But again, it is, it is the motion of the wheel that starts the song once more. Again, the voice does not bring back the key, that the, fam that the famous climax. <laughs> It always comes back to that. That is that that this this sort of double motion, the, the question of the harmonic motion, uh, and which part is given, the, which where the impulse comes from, whether it comes from voice or from piano, is very carefully worked by by Schubert. The next date of that one comes up is of course 1816, which is the Undefined Geliebte of Beethoven. And there you do indeed have a series of landscape poems. In fact, one can say this, I have to skip over the whole technique of the lead now in general, but one can say this about it, about the cycles. All the cycles consist of a series of memories. Uh, and when you think of it, that's a fairly normal thing, because a song cycle is a terrible way to tell a story. Uh, is that, is that, it's not a that is, it's not a very, very, it's a good idea to have, to try and, and get a narrative into 20 separate songs, or even if one song flows into another, it doesn't work. The only composer I know of who tried to tell a story with the song cycle is Brahms, in I think what is Brahms' most disastrous work. I think that's the only important work of Brahms that I'm absolutely unable to listen to, even when performed, sung very beautifully. Uh, the Schöne Magellan. Uh, in any case, is that, that comes way out of my period. It's after 1840, so I don't have to think about it. But all of the, all of the great song cycles are successions of memories. In fact, most of them, most of these successions of memories are not, in fact, a description of what was remembered. It's a description of something else seen that is a substitute for a memory. In other words, that the whole technique of landscape description, as we find it, in most of the poets, is being used in the whole structure of the song cycle. The song cycle rarely describes the actual memory. It describes the scene which recalls the memory. And you have that in already with the first important one, Antiferne Geliebte. What is interesting here is the way that effects of memory finally get into music. Now, in, there are two ways that Beethoven does this, and both of these 
are extraordinarily progressive for their time. That is, that they reach beyond Schubert into Schumann. Not, of course, that that is an accident. It's because Schumann relied very heavily upon on die Ferne Geliebte for his own song cycles. They're, they're, they're very closely related to it. Uh, one of the things that happens, I think, one can see in the, in, in the second song, is you have... with an echo. So, that, it begins that way, uh, with a very evocative, very, very, uh, with that kind of yearning theme, the most, uh, the most uh, extraordinary passage, however, occurs with the second phrase. When the singer stops singing the melody, what the singer sings is this. And suddenly, the actual sound of the of melody is given to the piano. So that you get this effect of, of musing of something heard, not directly, but heard from a distance again. Enough, the, the, these effects of distance are, are particularly important. This is, in fact, a spatial effect when you do that between voice and piano. Uh, the other example, which, uh, the other example of the uh, technique of, of recalling memory uh, is, of course, the famous, uh, famous uh, change from the in the middle of the last song, when the last song suddenly becomes the first song. Now, the way that is done is quite extraordinary. And it's a technique that Schumann used very extensively, but as far as I know, it is not used by anybody before Beethoven. You, you, you write a melody, two melodies, which resemble each other just sufficiently for one to turn into the other almost imperceptibly. This is, of course, this is rather different from the motivic developments that one has in Beethoven. That is, we, we all know that most of the melodies in a piece by Beethoven are very closely related to each other. And this is a technique that enabled him to do this. But this is rather a different one, because it is quite clear that the, that the two are supposed to be so closely related, and they're juxtaposed so that you, you are not quite aware of how it's done. That is, the, the, the last melody goes... Uh, starting... And the first melody is... So that when he holds in the middle, he actually he stops one of the melodies in the, in the middle of that first phrase and then goes on with the second. So and of course and the and the and the words at that point are is that these songs abolish the distance between us. Uh, by the way, one one small point which is sometimes misunderstood about these songs is that the the uh, they're, they're not a series of of, of scenes. Uh, scene one right after the other, this landscape scene one right after the other, and reminding the singer of the distant beloved, uh, they're remembered landscapes. That is, they're not only a landscape which brings memories, but they are memories of landscapes which brought memories. It is, in fact, this very extraordinary technique that one finds as well in Schumann uh, later, um, that, that the... the um, that is, in, in other words, this is, I think, one of the reasons why all of the lands, all of the great song cycles, the Antiferne the, the of Beethoven, the Schöne Müllerin, the Winterreise, the Frauenliebe Leben, and the Dichterliebe, all five, are all concerned with absence and death. That is, in fact, the subject of every one of them. The Schöne Müllerin ends with the brook that speaks of death to the singer. The Winterreise is the preparation for death from beginning to end of the cycle. The Frauenliebe und Leben is, uh, in fact, ends with the death of the husband, which means the death of the wife. That is, the death in life. Because it is assumed by the, the, the male chauvinist poet that once her husband is dead, her life is now over. This is made extremely clear that by the last song is that, that now this is the first time that you have ever hurt me. That is, by your death, 
And when she is finished with that song, the piano plays the first song. Now, this technique is one thing I do want to say, just uh, speak about for a few seconds, which is that something happens with this romantic da capo, that is, with the return, which is uh, sometimes misunderstood. One often finds in books that the romantics revive ternary form, that is, an ABA form, a form in which the beginning comes back at the end. And in a sense, I suppose that's true. It certainly is true in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in other ways. But in this case, it leads to a misunderstanding. This is not a return in the normal sense. That is, it's not like a minuet when a trio and then a return. What happens, of course, is quite specifically a memory. And that is I'm quite, quite interestingly shown by Schumann in the last of the cycles, even more than in the Frauenliebe und Leben, but which returns as a memory, of course, where he doesn't bring back the beginning. He brings back, out of the 16 songs, he brings back, I think it's the seventh, or I don't remember. It's one of the songs in the middle, which suddenly, at the very end, after the singer has finished, and which reappears as a memory, is that... never gets to finish the song. Because... This that song is, I'm sorry, there was, it should be still a six four chord again. So. <coughs> Uh, that the, 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 this, this appears, you see, not as a return, but literally as a memory. And uh, I want to give two, to finish this off, I want to give two very remarkable examples of this whole technique of memory in romantic music by calling upon the two pieces of Schumann, which are not, in fact, song cycles, although one of them is constructed exactly like a song cycle. The first one, which is not, is in the humoresque, where you have this very extraordinary effect of memory in a purely instrumental piece. Uh, we also get it, of course, in the Carnival, where there's a quotation from an early Schumann piece which comes in literally as a memory. That... <laughs> See, I mean, it is, it is it, in fact, if properly played, it sounds like something you've remembered, but can't quite go on with, because the next time it comes back a little longer. You see. The other thing is, in the humoresque, one of the most extraordinary of Schumann's conceptions, there's a passage where you don't play the melody. You play an echo of the melody. You play something that suggests the melody, but you don't play the melody at all. It's written. It's written in the middle. You have three staves, the top stave for the right hand and the bottom stave for the left hand, in the middle to look at, but you don't play it. That's this... So that returns, it's already a kind of suggestion of something not there, and that what, when it returns, it really is a memory. It returns this way. <laughs> well, a, a very extraordinary effect. The other is the piece on which the whole effect of memory is based is the Davidsbündler Tensor. The Davidsbündler Tensor is a piece of 18, a work of 18 short pieces which begins and ends in the wrong key. That is that it's fairly clear after you've heard about six of the pieces that this is really in B minor, because every time you hear B minor, it's good and solid, where nothing else is. The second piece is in B minor, the fourth piece is in B minor, and every piece is in B minor is played twice. You play it, you play it again, and it's, it's extraordinarily solid. And then you get to the end of the piece. I'm sorry I can't talk very much more about it, but I want to end this right here and ask for questions. When you get to the 17th piece, what happens is that you get 
a, pas a passage um, labeled um, as if from a distance. And you get literally an effect of spatial distance, which is evoked by the sound of spacing on the piano and by the pedal that is necessary. That. And finally, what happens after this the passage is fairly long, and uh, suddenly in the middle of it, you begin to play the second piece again, and it comes back exactly as a memory. the second piece all the way through with all the repeats and adding an enormous climax to it. And there is a clear end in B minor and then uh, Schumann re uh, writes uh, superfluously, uh, Eusebius added the following and you play a waltz in the wrong key as you play a waltz in C major. It's an extraordinarily pathetic very beautiful ending. But here you see in this the passage that the whole effect of memory is created by adding to a distance in space, a, a, a marvelous effect of spatial distance evoked metaphorically in sound, a specific spatial uh, uh, temporal distance, and there really is quite a long distance in time because the piece lasts for 33 minutes and, uh, or 34 minutes and you go back and, at the end and play the second of 18 pieces. And I think it is made the uh, second piece because if it were the first, it would be a much more ordinary return. Being the second, it is indeed a memory, and that effective distance is quite extraordinary. I think I should stop and ask for questions. You've been very patient with me so far. <laughs> This podcast has been brought to you by the New York Institute for the Humanities at NYU in conjunction with the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute. Our producer is Ben Branstein. Our thanks to Uli Baer and for their technical and design wizardry, Aaron Dowdy and Selena Lacazzi. For more information or if you'd like to subscribe to our podcast, visit our website at nyihumanities.org. That's all one word. Again, that's nyihumanities.org.